With the most Champions Leagues and League Cups of any English side and just one league title behind Manchester United, Liverpool easily stands as the most successful club in English football history. In total, they've bagged 69 major trophies, but it's funny to think that it all started because of a disagreement. When the Football League kicked off in 1888, Anfield was one of the original stomping grounds, though back then it wasn't home to the red of Liverpool, but rather the blue of Everton. On that historic first Saturday of league football, 8th September, Accrington were the visitors to face the Blues of Everton Football Club. In their blue and white quartered shirts, Everton made quite the impression at Anfield, even going on to win the league championship in 1891. Everton began with a man of the cloth, Reverend Chambers, who formed a team out of the newly built St. Domingo's Church. This wasn't some professional outfit, but rather a way to keep the local lads on the straight and narrow through the thrill of competitive football. After a bit of a kickabout in Stanley Park for about a year, they decided to rename themselves after the area where it all began, and thus Everton Football Club was born. But here's a quirky bit of history. The St. Domingo lads didn't actually meet at the church. Instead, they gathered at the Queen's Head Hotel on Village Street, just down the road from Ye Ancienta Everton Toffee House. That's where they picked up their nickname, the Toffees. In their early days, Everton played at a few different spots before finally settling on a green patch of land between Anfield Road and Walton Breck Road. And so Anfield, one of the world's most iconic football grounds, came to be. The team thrived under the guidance of John Holding, a local brewer, council member, and eventually the mayor of Liverpool. Holding, known fondly as King John of Everton, left his mark on the area. If you ever find yourself wandering down the tiny Holding Street, you'll notice the Sand and Pub at the corner. That pub was once Holdings, and it was in the Bowls Pavilion out back where many of Everton's club meetings took place. In fact, for many years, the players even used it as their dressing room. John Holding was once the saviour of Everton Football Club, no doubt about it. Back in 1884, when Everton were booted out of their Priory Road ground due to the sheer size of the crowds, they were in a right mess. The place where they used to play is now a petrol station, if you can believe it. Faced with the financial nightmare of building a new stadium, the future of the club hung in the balance. Two of the bigwigs on the management committee, William Barclay and W. Jackson, turned to Holding for help. He was a wealthy businessman, a lover of sport and exactly the man they needed. They asked him to bail the club out and though there were no guarantees, Holding agreed. He was looking at forking out £6,000 to build the new stadium, an absolutely huge sum in those days, considering £1,000 could pay an entire team's wages for a year. In return, he'd only get £100 a year in rent. But he didn't hesitate, he stepped in to save Everton. However, that's where the trouble began. Some members of the Everton board weren't too happy with holding. It wasn't just about the rent, which kept going up. They didn't like that only his ales were sold at the ground, which lined his pockets even more. But to be fair to Holding, whenever Everton needed money, whether it was for new players or to spruce up the stadium, it was Holding who stepped in. The dressing room situation at the Sandon pub, well, that was a bit dodgy too. The players had to get changed there, and you can guess who benefited from that arrangement. Yep, Holding, as they drank his products after matches. A letter to the Liverpool Echo in January. 1892 called it out as a disgrace, saying it was ridiculous for a big club like Everton to have players walking through the crowds on match day just to get to the pitch. By the 1889-1890 season, things had come to a head. The rent at Anfield had gone up from 100 to 250 pounds and the board wasn't happy. Holding though had a solution. He wanted to turn Everton into a public limited company. At a meeting he chaired on the 15th of September 1891, with the local press banned to keep things quiet, he put forward the idea that Everton should buy Anfield, along with some extra land he owned next to it. The board weren't convinced, they thought the price was too high. Then, in October, it all fell apart. The majority of the board and players walked out, determined to build a new ground. Holding later explained, in a match programme against Cliftonville in April 1893, that he'd given Everton a rent-free loan until the club started making money. If they'd gone under, he would have lost it all. Despite not profiting from this, what really riled the Everton members was his plan to sell Anfield and the adjoining land, which would see Holding make some money for himself. He thought it was a fair reward for the nine years he'd backed the club, but the board just didn't see it that way. 
They were looking for a long-term rent deal, and when Holding asked for a price they thought was too high, they tried offering him less. Unsurprisingly, Holding refused, and tensions hit breaking point. He couldn't believe he was being treated so poorly after everything he'd done for the club. The final split came on the 12th of March, 1892, at a members' meeting where George Mahon, one of Holding's biggest opponents, took charge. When Holding showed up, Mahon politely offered him the chair, but surrounded by people who clearly didn't have his back, Holding famously said, I'm here on trial, and a criminal never takes the chair before walking out with around 18 or 19 other members. It was at John Holding's house on Anfield Road where he and a few close mates, after walking out on Everton, decided to start fresh. The idea of forming a new club was on the table, and William E. Barclay, a proper football enthusiast, was the one who suggested the name we all know today, Liverpool. And just like that, on the 15th of March, 1892, Liverpool Football Club was born. Luckily, one man who stuck by holding was John McKenna, along with Barclay, who took on the role of secretary. Now McKenna, what a man he was. Born in Ireland, McKenna became the heart and soul of this new venture. He didn't just have the charm, he had the football know-how to back it up. Over the next three decades, McKenna served as a director at Anfield, chaired the club on two occasions, and became a towering figure in English football. He joined the FA Council in 1905, became president of the Football League in 1910, and later Vice President of the Football Association in 1928. The man was involved in every important football committee going until his death in 1936. He wasn't just well respected, he was one of the brains behind Liverpool's early success. Holding may have founded the club, but McKenna was the driving force behind it. With a £500 loan from Holding, never paid back mind you, McKenna recruited over a dozen players from Scotland, which led to the team being dubbed the team of all the Max due to their Scot their early goalkeeper Bill McCowan was actually English. Liverpool's first application to join the Football League was turned down, so they started life in the Lancashire League. On the 1st of September 1892, Liverpool AFC played their first ever match at Anfield, a friendly against Rotherham from the Midland League. Meanwhile, on the very same day, Everton were playing their first game over at Goodison Park, right across Stanley Park. The rivalry had begun. Liverpool, trying to make a statement, announced in the papers, no better game will be witnessed on any of the plots in the neighbourhood. A cheeky dig at Everton. When the match kicked off, with councillor Jay Holding doing the honours, Liverpool smashed Rotherham 7-1. McVean scored the first ever Liverpool goal early in the first half, and the team were off to a flyer. The only downer? Hardly anyone showed up, just a handful of fans. Over 10,000 on the other hand, went to watch Everton at Goodison. A couple of days later, Liverpool played their first competitive game in the Lancashire League and smashed it again, winning 8-0. The match had been delayed because the other team turned up late, but once it got going, there was no stopping Liverpool. McVean, who was captain, won the toss and chose to play towards Anfield Road in the first half, starting a tradition that Liverpool captains still follow today. That match set the tone for an incredible debut season for Liverpool. They didn't just walk away with the Lancashire League title, they also scooped up the Liverpool District Cup. And just for good measure, they added a reserve cup to the hall as well, securing a modest treble. A pretty impressive achievement for a club that wasn't even a year old. Needless to say, Everton were starting to get a bit nervous about their new rivals. The following season, Liverpool stepped up to the big time. After just one season in the second division, they were promoted to the first division. Liverpool quickly established themselves as one of England's top clubs, winning league titles in 1901, 1906, 1922 and 1923. By this point, the club was already a fan favourite, but consistency wasn't their strong suit. After the Second World War, Liverpool picked up their fourth league title in 1947, but then things went a bit downhill. They entered a period of mediocrity, and by 1954 they were relegated to the second division. But everything changed when Bill Shankly walked through the door. He was hired as manager, and in typical Shankly fashion he shook things up. His first move? Releasing 24 squad players. He didn't stop there though. Shankly transformed the club's old storage room into what would become the legendary boot room, a secret meeting place for coaches that would shape Liverpool's success for the next 30 years. Shankly's methods may have been unorthodox, but they worked wonders. Liverpool fought their way back to the first division in 1962 and just two years later lifted the league title. Under Shankly, they went on to win two more league titles, two FA Cups and their first European trophy the 1973 UEFA Cup. In 1974, needing a break from the game, Bill Shankly decided to hang up his boots 
having done the job of bringing Liverpool back to the first division and winning a whopping 10 trophies along the way. Shankly's retirement might have felt like a blow at the time, but the man had laid such a rock-solid foundation that the club didn't miss a beat. It was a smooth transition from Shankly to his right-hand man, Bob Paisley, who picked up exactly where Shankly left off, keeping the good times rolling at Anfield. Change in leadership didn't do much to halt Liverpool's dominance. When Bob Paisley took over, Liverpool became a model of consistency. In just nine years under his guidance, they clinched an incredible six league titles and three league cups. And they weren't just kings of England, they took Europe by storm, winning a UEFA Cup and three European Cups between 1976 and 1981. Paisley retired in 1983, leaving behind a legacy that seemed impossible to match. But his assistant, Joe Fagan, picked up right where he left off. Fagan's first season in charge was nothing short of brilliant. He led Liverpool to a treble, winning the league, the League Cup, and the European Cup. But things took a tragic turn in 1985, when Liverpool faced Juventus in the European Cup final, a game forever scarred by the Heisel disaster. Some unruly fans caused a wall to collapse, and 39 supporters tragically lost their lives. In the wake of that disaster, the blame was squarely placed on Liverpool fans, leading to a five-year ban for all English clubs from European competitions. With European football off the table, Liverpool shifted focus to domestic competitions, and they didn't slow down immediately. They added two more league titles in 1986 and 1988, plus an FA Cup in 1986. But then came another heartbreaking tragedy. In 1989, during the FA Cup semi-final against Nottingham Forest, 94 Liverpool fans lost their lives in the Hillsborough disaster, a devastating crowd crush that remains the darkest day in English football history. Despite the grief, Liverpool managed to claim their ninth league title in 1990, but that was the last hurrah. From there, the club fell into a bit of a downward spiral, the league in one of the tightest title races in English football history. By the last game, Liverpool and Arsenal were neck and neck. Same points, same goal difference, same games won, drawn and lost. It was like they were mirror images on the table. So the title had to be decided on goals scored, and that's where Arsenal edged it. What made it even more gutting for Liverpool fans was that they were on the brink of winning the title on goal difference right up until the last day. But then, in the dying moments of the final game, Arsenal popped up with a last-minute goal, e proper football tragedy. Fast forward two years, and Kenny Dalglish resigned as manager, citing the Hillsborough disaster and its emotional toll as the reason for his departure. In came Graeme Saunas, a Liverpool legend from his playing days between 1978 and 1984, but his stint as manager wasn't exactly one to remember. He did manage to win the FA Cup in 1992, but two sixth-place finishes in the Premier League spelled trouble, and by 1994, he was shown the door. Roy Evans took the reins next, leading Liverpool to a League Cup victory in 1995. But like Souness, he struggled to bring the league title back to Anfield, with his best finishes being third place in 1996 and 1998. By the end of 1998, Evans called it a day, and Gerard Houllier stepped in. Julia breathed new life into the club, and in 2001 he delivered a treble, the FA Cup, League Cup and UEFA Cup, ending a six-year trophy drought. In the FA Cup final that year, Liverpool came from behind to beat Arsenal 2-1, thanks to a brace from Michael Owen. That same year, Owen went on to win the Ballon d'Or, becoming the first Englishman to do so in 22 years, and the last one to win it to this day. In 2004, Rafa Benitez was brought in to replace Gerard Houllier, and it didn't take him long to win over the Anfield faithful. Sure, he only managed a fifth-place finish in the Premier League that season, but honestly, no one cared. Why? Because he led the Reds to one of the most iconic nights in football history, the famous Miracle of Istanbul. Liverpool were 3-0 down at half-time against Carlo Ancelotti's AC Milan in the Champions League final, and all hope seemed lost, but somehow, someway, the lads mounted an unbelievable comeback in the second half. They dragged it to penalties, and wouldn't you know it, Liverpool won the game and lifted the trophy, ending a 21-year wait for a European crown. That night cemented Liverpool's status as the most successful English club in European competition and third overall, behind only Real Madrid and AC Milan. Liverpool found themselves in another Champions League final in 2007, again facing Milan. This time though, Milan got their revenge and Liverpool fell short. Still, Benitez's time at the club was hugely successful, but after a disappointing seventh place finish in 2010, 
he parted ways with the club. Around the same time, Liverpool were on the brink of financial collapse. In October 2010, the club was sold to John W. Henry and Fenway Sports Group, a move that saved Liverpool from bankruptcy. Not long after, Roy Hodgson, who had taken over from Benitez, left the club, and the return of Kenny Dalglish had the fans buzzing. But Dalglish's second spell in charge didn't live up to the magic of his first. Despite winning the League Cup and reaching the FA Cup final, a disappointing league finish saw him sacked in 2012. Enter Brendan Rodgers. He revitalised the squad, and in the 2013-2014 season, Liverpool were within touching distance of their first league title in over two decades. It all came crashing down though, with that infamous slip by Steven Gerrard against Chelsea, causing them to miss out on the trophy by just two points. That one still stings for a lot of fans. The following season wasn't even half as good as the one before. Liverpool ended up finishing sixth, missing out on Champions League football, and the 2015-2016 season didn't start any better. So, Rodgers was sacked, and in came Jurgen Klopp. The German gaffer hit the ground running, taking Liverpool to both the League Cup and Europa League finals in his first season. Sure, he lost both finals, but you could just feel something exciting was brewing at Anfield. Klopp's revolution gathered pace, and soon enough, he led Liverpool to their first Champions League final in 11 years. It was a gut-wrenching loss to Real Madrid, especially after Mo Salah had to leave early due to a nasty injury. But Liverpool weren't done. The very next season, they produced one of the most incredible comebacks in European history, overturning a 3-0 deficit to Barcelona in the Semis. This time, they beat Spurs in the final to claim their sixth Champions League title. That triumph cemented Liverpool as the most successful English club in Europe. They'd now won twice as many European Cups as Manchester United and were sitting pretty as the third most successful club in Champions League history. But there was still something missing, the league. Liverpool hadn't lifted the Premier League since its inception in 1992. They came so close in 2019, finishing with a club record 97 points, losing just one game all season only to miss out on the title by a single point. That was a killer blow, but instead of folding, they came back stronger. In 2020, Liverpool didn't just win the Premier League, they dominated it. They finished 18 points clear of second place, racking up a record-breaking 99 points. They clinched the title with seven games to go, the earliest any team has ever won the Premier League, and equaled the record for most wins in a season with 32. It was total domination, and it ended their 30-year wait for a league title. Truly special. Liverpool nearly repeated their league success in 2022, but heartbreak struck again. They finished just one point behind Manchester City, agonisingly missing out on the title. That season was a tough one to swallow. The Reds were on for a historic quadruple, but ended up with just the League Cup and FA Cup. They lost the Champions League final to Real Madrid again, and once more, lost the league on the final day. Fast forward to January 2024, Klopp dropped a bombshell. He announced he'd be leaving at the end of the season. He signed off with a League Cup win and received an emotional farewell in his last game at Anfield. Klopp left as one of the most loved and successful managers in Liverpool's history, a true Anfield legend. Arne Slot has stepped in to take the reins, aiming to keep Liverpool at the top of English football, and he's not wasting any time. The Dutchman has hit the ground running, winning his first three games of the season in style, including a 3-0 thrashing of Manchester United at Old Trafford. What a way to make a statement. Slot's already got the fans buzzing, and it looks like Liverpool are set to carry on their dominance under his leadership. Cheers for watching, folks. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of the future releases. If you enjoyed this one, make sure to check out some of the other cracking videos on the channel. Catch you in the next video.